Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're at the Chilton Library and the Building Committee is very excited to uh, present to you the revised schematic design of the Tilton expansion. Um, first, I'm going to go over just a quick um, brief history of the project for those of you that may not know um, the details. And then um, Sat, uh, Satu is going to go over the building committee process in revising this design. And then we'll hand it over to our architect and project manager. So my name is Candace Bradbury Carlin. I'm the director of Tilton Library. Um, we'll start with the history. Why did we do this? So in 2009, the community identified uh, the need for a lot more space and for updates in the building. So, um, you know, the building is over 100 years old, so it was time. And in 2014, we started the process of applying for a grant from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And we were put on a waiting list in 2017. And lo and behold, last summer, we were offered the grant in July 2022. Went through the process that most of you, if not all of you, went through in the fall with um, the, uh, the special town meeting and special election, and it passed. And in January, we signed a grant with the um, MBLC to get started. Um, so the design elements, I'm just gonna go over briefly, which the architect will go over more in depth in a few minutes. But what has to stay in the design is the amount of space, the elements of the design as outlined in the grant. And what's new will be a large meeting room on the first floor um, that's part of a lobby that has a, a kitchen and restrooms that will be open to the community to use during and after hours. We'll have two medium-sized meeting rooms upstairs. One will act as a um, multi-purpose room, slash maker space slash co-working space and the other will be a, a quiet gathering space we'll have two small quiet study rooms that can also be used as tutoring rooms we'll have a business center we'll have a lobby cafe we'll have larger rooms for our children and teens we'll have more computers more seating areas more room for books media and library of things more restrooms a better and bigger elevator more functional outdoor spaces and better HVAC and energy efficiency. The next phase after um, tonight's meeting is um, called the design development phase. And that is getting just a little bit more detail with the design. After that, we'll enter into the construction document phase, which gets even more detailed and will allow us at the end of that phase, will allow us to put it out to bid for construction. Um, if the timing goes the way we're planned, planning it, then that will happen, the bid will happen in the fall. We will empty the premises, leave the premises um, to set up shop in a temporary space and construction will begin in January. So tonight we're here to show you the schematic design, but before we get into more detailed design, the building committee, trustees and staff are very excited about this design. Hey, thank you, Candace. Um, my name is Satu Zoller and I chair the Tilton Board of Trustees. And I'm also chair of the building and design committee that was put together uh, in, to work with the architect and project manager to, to oversee the library project. Um, basically, after the vote passed, which was very exciting, um, we were asked to put together a committee of, of citizens representing kind of key stakeholders in the library to, to work with the project manager and with the architect. So the committee includes representatives from the select board, the finance committee, the planning board, the trustees, uh, the library director, and citizens. So I'm just going to introduce the committee very quickly. So Candace is on the committee, as am I, and Tim Hilchey from the select board. Uh, Julie Chalfant, I think, is also here from the finance committee. Judy Holmes. Vern Harrington, I don't think, is here. Um, Ava Tor is here. Uh, Denise Mason from the planning board and myself. So we'll also be happy to answer questions a little bit later. Um, I'm gonna now introduce Phil O'Brien, who's our project architect right here, and Dan Pilata is our project manager. Um, I also ask that you save questions for the end so Phil can walk through the new design smoothly, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna try to share my screen here so that folks everywhere can... I 
<laughs> well, there should be a on the bottom of your screen. You should see a green button that says sh uh, share screen. You have permission. All right, there it is. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this. Um, I, I won't linger too, too long, and I will try to kind of fill in some of the blanks as, as we go along. Um, obviously, you've got a, a beautiful building at, at the Tilton Library. We've got uh, just a couple of shots here of existing conditions to remind you all. Uh, nice old building. Uh, basically, looks like it sits up uh, a little bit on a rise, which was very popular for building in this era. Um, is that better? All right. Um, but basically, it sits on a very flat site, and the and the soil around the front was kind of uh, lumped up around the entrance, so that you can have this grand staircase up to the second floor, which looks great, um, but is kind of hard to manage. So almost everybody goes into the small addition that was placed onto the left uh, with an entrance on grade. Once you get into that little addition, you can either go directly into the lower level uh, at grade, or you can take the stairs or a handicapped accessible lift up to the second floor. Uh, I think folks are familiar with that. Around the back of the library, for those of you that don't, don't go back there very often, uh, it's just as handsome in the back, uh, and the addition is maybe not as handsome in the back. <laughs> um, but you could see where that door is in the center of the rear. Uh, you can we're basically right on grade, and that's we're going to take advantage of that for the addition of the building, so that we can have an accessible entrance right at the lower level for the proposed addition. Uh, inside the building, um, it, it's beautiful upstairs. Uh, it's functional to a certain extent downstairs, um, but I think you can tell by both these photographs, uh, it's pretty crowded. Uh, you're pretty much at the end of uh, life in terms of useful space inside the building. Uh, but you take a look at that picture on the left. This is just some beautiful spaces in that existing building, and we want to take advantage of those spaces. And so one of the things that we're going to do is pull all the book stacks out of these spaces and really take advantage of them so you can get in there and use them for kind of the way they're intended uh, to kind of sit and read and take advantage of the space that's there. So this is an aerial photograph showing the site. Um, the reason I put this up there is for a couple of reasons. You could see, if you look closely down on the bottom left, um, you could see a couple of cars parked in the grass, and then there's a parking lot kind of underneath that big tree that sits at the side of the building, and then there's another couple of big trees at the rear. Um, when we applied for the grant, we were proposing an addition that went straight back and was going to eliminate that large maple tree there. We've changed the plans now, uh, and the design is going to be a little bit different, and so we're proposing a building that doesn't uh, require the removal of that tree. Uh, so basically, we've taken the addition and compressed it down a little bit and stretched it out to the left-hand side. Uh, what that really means is that on the site uh, where the parking lot is now, uh, which basically paves all around that beautiful tree that you have there, we're going to leave that nice big tree in the front, take out the paving around it, and turn that into a nice lawn, uh, and then move the parking over closer to that older church building, uh, which is next door to the, to the left. Uh, all the addition goes out the rear, uh, and the angle actually helps with a variety of things in the plan, as well as keeping away from that tree. Um, it helps open up the entrance in the front and create a little bit more of that lawn space, but it also allows us to stay away from that tree, uh, which is actually a little bit more on the right-hand side. We can also compress the space kind of between the larger portion of the addition, that larger turned rectangle, and the original building by squeezing that down a little bit. And so there really just is enough room for the stair and the elevator in there. So this is the, that says the lower floor plan, but that is the upper floor plan. I'm going to start downstairs. So you can come right into the center of the building here. Um, and as Candace mentioned, uh, the rest of the library can be locked off in the evening so that you can have access to the meeting room, which is on the left-hand side, and the toilets, the kitchenette that goes with that, the storage spaces that are associated with that. All that acts as a nighttime suite in, in, in the building uh, by just locking those set of, that set of doors. Once you go through those doors on the right-hand side, when you come in, uh, you can get access to the lower lobby. That's where there's going to be a cafe space. The yellow portion of the building shows the existing plan. We're going to renovate that lower level and then turn that into some support spaces. The mechanical room is going to stay down there. There's going to be a space down there for friends. There'll be storage down there, a staff toilet, and then a staff break room will be down there. 
the right hand side of the addition is the majority of that is the children's department and there's an, a desk and, a, and an office for the children's librarians and there's a toilet in there so that folks can um, be confident that their kids could use the bathroom without having to leave the room uh, they can kind of keep an eye on them and keep them corralled in the in the children's department so if you take the stairs of the elevator to the upper floor um you're basically you come into the joint between the new building and uh and the existing building and when you get to the top of the stairs or come out of the elevator you can either take a left or a right go into the existing building and again we've taken the book stacks out of those large rooms we're going to restore those large rooms that are in there um, and then turn them into reading and uh workspaces useful spaces that people can utilize uh really take advantage of those beautiful rooms the fireplaces that are in there um and uh, just have be able to sit and have a good read um, and or do other functions like uh, work on a project, uh, go to a small lecture. Uh, there's a variety of different things we could use those spaces. We're trying to make it as, as effective as possible. Or uh, you could go into the addition right at the center of the addition. When you come up the stairs or come off the elevator is the circulation desk with the staff work room right behind. The teens have a room of their own on the right hand side with a desk for the teens librarian. Uh, or if you take a left, uh, along the bottom portion there, there's um, a director's office, the two quiet study rooms and the toilets, um, and then book stacks are down at the end with some reading spaces. And then there's a little bit of a bay window that pokes out over the rear, um, looks out towards that beautiful tree you have there with some nice reading spaces and some computers and so forth. So now we come to a couple of images of what the building might look like. So the first couple of images here is, is what you might see kind of coming down North Main Street. Um, you'll recognize your senior center there in the church and in the kind of background is what you would see when you're driving down the road um, and you approach in the library with the addition to the rear. As you get a little closer, you can see one of the benefits of taking that addition and kind of pushing it back on an angle is that it opens up that, uh, that entrance uh, makes it um, a little bit more welcoming, gives you a nice big green lawn uh, at the front of the entrance uh, adjacent to the sidewalk. And this image gives you a good idea about what we mean by allowing that original building to maintain its prominence, even though we're doing an addition that's a pretty good size. We don't want that addition to overwhelm your beautiful existing building. And so one of the things that putting the building on an angle does is it helps it to kind of disappear into the background because it sets back from the existing building a little bit more and kind of fades away. So the building is designed, the addition is designed to be sympathetic to um, the original building, kind of takes its cues in terms of its overall size and its mass and the materials and so forth that we're using in there um takes those cues from the original building but we're not trying to replicate that building we want that building to maintain its beauty out on the street um and this one to kind of recede a little bit uh it's not an uncommon thing to do with a building like this um even a building that uh was built in this era that might have had a separate stack wing at the rear and there's some other examples and surrounding communities that are similar to this that that original stack wing at the rear would have been done very similarly um same materials but um kind of toned down on the decorative uh masonry and so forth at the rear and that's exactly what we're doing with this edition you can see the church and the, the church building on the side there kind of walking around the building you can see how the on this on this side the building doesn't poke out very far from the original building. The retaining walls that kind of reach out like a couple of arms from the front of the original building are, are there. They're there now to support that grating that was kind of lumped up in front of the building to give it that kind of classical raised look. But the grating around and the rest of the uh, around the addition pretty much is going to stay the way it is pretty flat. So this would be what the new entrance would look like, what you'd see coming in the new driveway. And there's that lawn and that nice big tree that you have there that sits in the corner of the building. The entrance is underneath that canopy there, right at the joint, kind of between the new and the old. So it's undercover. If you get out from the parking lot, you're covered almost all the way out to the parking lot there. Um, the other benefit of that canopy is, is that 
You, if you had a program on the grass, you could have somebody set up that was speaking under the canopy. You could set up tables there for a book sale, for example, and keep them out of the weather if you got a little bit of rain. Here's a view from inside the parking lot. You see the end of the building there uh, of the addition is pretty much takes its cues in terms of its size uh, from the existing building. There's a better look at that canopy in the entrance. <clears throat> so this is kind of standing on the lawn in front of the church, taking a look, the church building, taking a look back towards the addition and the original building there. Pulling around to the side, looking at the rear lawn, you can see that large tree that we're going to maintain there on the left. And then there's that overhanging area on the second floor where the reading spaces are that you could sit and take a look out to the landscape and the play fields at the back. That overhang also acts as a canopy uh, for the doors that come out of the rear portion of that building. And the one on the right comes out of the rear side of the lobby and the one on the left comes directly out of the children's department. So if they decide they wanna have an outdoor program on a nice day on the lawn at the rear under that, <laughs> under that maple tree, they could do that without having to leave the children's department, they're going to go directly outside. This is swinging back around to the other end. And back to the front. The next slide we have is a schedule. And I think Dan's going to talk about where we are on the schedule and where we're headed. I know you can't read the schedule, so we just want to let you know there's a schedule. So um, as uh, Candace had indicated, we're, we're currently in design development and design developments where we pick all the systems, the structure, uh, the basic materials of the building and the building gets developed with the structural frame and the uh, spaces necessary for all of the utilities, both on the interior and exterior of the building. And at the end of design development, which will probably take us sometime around uh, uh, end of June, uh, we will do a cost estimate and the cost estimate will be reviewed by the designer and the OPM to make sure that the design that we've come up with fits within the appropriation. This is a normal, uh, this is a normal uh, standard of operation for a public project. We will then move on to construction documents. Uh, construction documents is where every little detail of the building gets detailed and identified down to the screws on the hinges of the doors, to the colors of the carpets, to every little thing uh, will be identified. Uh, that takes months and months of time. Uh, the specification book for this building will be about this thick. Drawings will probably be about, I don't know, 80 drawings for this project. Maybe 108. 100, 100 <laughs> drawings for this project because it's on an angle. And, <laughs> and uh, when we're about 60% through with the construction documents, we, we, we take a breath and we do another cost estimate and we make sure that the construction documents are, are not being over specified and over detailed. Uh, we do a constructability review to make sure the building can be put together with relative ease. Uh, and, and these are all tools of to the trade that the OPM and the designer will use to keep the project on track. Upon the completion of uh, those documents, which is gonna be sometime in October, we'll immediately go to bidding. Uh, and uh, with bidding, uh, it's usually a six to eight week pro process. Uh, we're going to try and get it done in six weeks uh, so that we land just about a week before Christmas or a little more than 10 days before Christmas. And uh, we bid uh, certain trades first, uh, pursuant to Massachusetts general laws, and then we bid the general contractor second using the uh, numbers from the <clears throat> using the numbers from the trades that get bid first. So uh, once we have the general contractor's bid in hand, we uh, do some more exhaustive reviews of the contract to make sure the contract is legitimate and can handle a building of this size, has a track record of projects like this. And then we make a recommendation that the building committee 
uh, make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to award the contract. The Board of Selectmen will award the contract and about 14 days later, contracts will be signed, bonds and insurances will be received uh, and uh, the project will move forward. <clears throat> and that is it. Seems easy. <laughs> <laughs> Lease is on our project in Greenfield, which is 99.99% uh, .99 complete right now. She's the assistant director in Greenfield, and she she can tell you it's it's not an easy thing to go from step A to step B to step C to step D. So, uh, but we're going to get there, and uh, we're going to give you a beautiful library. So now we're opening up to questions. Oh, and, uh, and when you ask your question, please come to the um, table right in front of us here with the microphones so people can hear you. Um, Tim Melchi from the building committee. Do you have any ability to do any of the, the rotating of the building with the, you know, just to give them a better uh, viewpoint with what you've done with us? Yes. <laughs> There's going to be a show off here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, Reed Predmore. Um, the stuff that sticks out on the uh, north side of the building, sort of white, is kind of jarring. Is that, could that be brick or? Uh, it certainly could be. It's one of those things we could look at. We, we've had a similar discussion discussion with the the building committee. Uh, actually, the idea of that is that it's kind of inspired by um, the white masonry that's on your existing building. Um, it may look a little stark here, um, but that's maybe just the function of the modeling that we're doing. Uh, the idea is, is that it's supposed to be very similar to that same material. I'm just curious, because it. Oh, okay. Hey. okay. So if anybody gets uh, motion sickness or anything, yes. close your eyes. Yeah, get motion sickness. <laughs> Let me know. I'll try to go slower. Oh, okay. Trevor McDaniel, my question is: When you rotate that a little better, how do you how are you plan to deal with the water coming off of both both pitches right there in the middle? That's that's a good question. We will have um, roof drains there uh, that bring the bring the water either over the edges of the roof and then down uh, into a stormwater management system, or we will bring it inside. That's one of those things that we're working on with in, during the design development and talking to the plumbing engineers about the best way to manage that. That's something. This is not the first time that we've done that, but it, it's certainly going to be capable of maintaining uh, that load with snow and ice and so forth. Yes. I know. Right now, we have an issue on the very front peak where the water comes off that roof and hits the front doorway. Kind of, it, it's if you see inside the building, that'll be an area to address in the remodel part of it. But there's some drains, I think, in that roof that might be stopped up. I know we looked at that about a year ago. So right in, right in right here. In there. Yep, yeah. you'll see there's drains that come right down inside the wall, and I think they're stopped up. Yeah, this model doesn't show those drains, no, but probably not. Um, but I, I think you mean with anytime you have a little parapet wall like this, and the yeah. water and snow and ice coming down, you have a little spot in there that's right. a little tricky to deal with. And um, it, it's lifting the plaster on the inside of the building because it's kind of getting wet inside. There might be something plugged up in there. Yeah, we, to look at we want to maintain this nice old roof you have on the I, building, but yeah. it, it's going to need a little bit of help. And so what we're calling for is some some patching, um, and basically. Um, we may get down, somebody has obviously come along and put metal, I don't think it's original, on the on the sides there to help um, solve some of the problems that you have. That metal probably helps with things like ice dams and things like that. Um, you have a little bit of an overhang. Um, overhangs are obviously important for those. You, well, you all live in New England, you know that when the water runs down and melts off the roof and then gets out over your overhang where there's no heat, it can refreeze and form a little lump that can, that can create a dam. Uh, having the metal there helps. To, to help that slide off. But we will take a look at that. I'm sorry, I'm kind of giving you a helicopter view. I'll try to get- I see also there's a couple of questions in the Zoom room. Um, so Barbara and then iPhone, I don't know who that is. So it, please unmute yourself and then ask your question. 
Hi, this is Barbara. I have a question on the exterior and one on the interior. For the exterior, uh, currently we have a small concert stage. Will there be some accommodation for um, the outdoor concerts in this design? And on the interior, um, was there a computer room where you could have a class for, I don't know, four to six or eight people? So I assume you're going to take the second one on the computers. Um, I, I could certainly elaborate on that. But as far as outside, one of the things that we mentioned here is that um, where your parking lot is now, close to the building, kind of wrapped around this tree, um, we're going to move your parking lot out to create a lawn here in the front so that you will have an opportunity to potentially um, set up somebody underneath the canopy here and be able to plug into the electricity that we'll have along that outside wall. Um, and you could potentially do a, a presentation with people sitting on the lawn here in the front. Um, as far as the space in the back, there's still a fair amount of space between that existing, that big tree that you have there and the original building. We need to maintain all that space so that that tree has room to grow. This the, the canopy on that tree and the roots underneath extend out pretty far close to the building. And so we, we need to be very careful of that. But there's still a fair amount of space available. Um, it's a little subtle, but you can see that we put a slightly brighter green uh, on the library's property so you can kind of see where the property line is. Uh, on the back side of that property line is more town property. Um, there may be some bushes in there and so forth, but uh, there's certainly property there if you wanted to have a function there. And on the opposite side of the building, uh, there is a little bit of space as well between you and the bushes and trees at your neighbor where you could potentially do something. So Phil, right where that where your little hand is on the screen, there is a, a stone stage that was put in a couple of years ago. Um, so I think that's what Barbara's talking about. Okay. And I, yes. And th that could certainly stay. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's what, that's what I thought. Um, so that's what we use currently for uh, things like concerts because there's an outlet there. So with the front, we'd have a third option for for programs and outdoor um, concerts. Now, do you want me to go back to the floor plan to answer the question about there? Or are you sure? Like... But I didn't hear. I couldn't hear the whole question about the computers. Can you can you say that again, Barbara? Yeah. Before we leave the concert area, as I'm looking at the picture, is there a way? Or is there just an exterior plug on the patio currently that I, or were we using that back door? We'll probably use the back door from the children's room. So, so there's I, I, much, you know, there's a lot more space than with the new building to go out the back door for. Right. Um, just a consideration. Sure, sure. But the tech question I had is I, not sure that I saw like a, a computer room or um, we could use what's there, but is there a bank of computers or are they just kind of randomly placed like two here, two there? Well, back when we first designed, um, uh, did this design, you know, desktop computers were the thing that, that were things are being used um, in most places, especially libraries. So we'll, we'll have a, a mixture of uh, desktop and laptops um that people can use and uh in the back of the upstairs plan um you know that kind of like pop out space and then also the to the left of that where the adult books are where the stacks are those are all tables that can be used for computers and some will have desktop and some you can put a, lap, a laptop there working on okay thank you sure yep. do some of the modeling inside here let's see Candace, we still have a hand raise from the person who's identified as iPhone. Um, yeah, hi, this is Pam Tasha. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I just had a question about the um, design on the back. The, it looks beautiful. Um, it does look like it has some big expanses of glass. And I was wondering what measures you're gonna take to prevent bird collisions with that glass. That is a good question. Um, there, there are a number of things that we can do to help with bird collisions. Um, and the most important thing probably is, oh, I've backed into your shed. Um, <laughs> um, the most important thing that we can do is to provide some kind of um, like a frit um, or a kind of a tint on the glass. Um, a frit works better than a tint 
um, because it 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 creates um, it does a couple of things. It still provides shading, um, and it and it also dark there. Yeah, I don't know why that happens. Um, but it will it 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 still will provide some shading inside the building. Um, it will still allow the view to the outside, but it does provide uh, a little um, obscuration of the glass to make it less transparent, so that we don't have uh, as many problems with with bird collisions. Um, one of the other things that we could do is we could take another look at whether or not we wanted to do windows on the angle. For example, um, these can sometimes be confusing for birds uh, if they can see directly through the building uh, because this is reasonably small. Um, the, uh, the amount of space that's available on the opposite side that can, will confuse them when they're kind of flying in that direction is limited. Um, but the corners of the building itself um, do have windows. There's a window here and a window on that corner. And so the question is whether or not a bird will be confused and think that they can fly through there and then hit the glass. Um, so if we put some... Um, some fritting on the glass, which is basically a, a ceramic coating that is baked directly onto the glass and doesn't need to be maintained. It won't come off. Um, it will provide some additional shading, still allow the views to the outside, um, and will work in conjunction with any other interior shading that you decide to do in the building. Um, we did that at the library in Hadley, if anybody has uh, been to Hadley. Uh, you'll see that there's fritting on that glass there. Um, I wouldn't expect that you'd be able to see it directly from the street. You'd have to walk up pretty close or get close to it from the inside in order to be able to see it. Uh, it's one of the benefits of it. It helps with the birds, but it's um, it pretty much stays out of the way and allows you to uh, view in and out of the building. Um, but it does also cut down on the amount of kind of solar gain that we have that costs you extra money. Okay. For you're me. Oh, no, I'm just watching. I'm not participating. Um. So that would be awesome. I would love to see um, our town put fretting on the glass um, for that purpose, both from a bird perspective and an energy savings perspective. Um, so I love that you have some experience with that and um, appreciate hearing about that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Milne, um, just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the heating and cooling. Is it... Um, all solar or a combination? So we have, you've probably, you probably noticed that on the front of the building. Um, we're, we're looking at solar panels on, on the roof of the building. Um, this portion of the building faces mostly south, and we are looking at a photovoltaic array on that, on that portion, portion of the roof. Um, haven't done the engineering yet, so I can't tell you what the percentage of the electrical load that this will support. I don't know the answer to that yet, um, but we are in the midst of working on that, what our engineers. We are planning on an all-electric system, so at this point, there's no fossil fuels being used for anything inside the building, whether it's for heating or domestic water or um, hot water for the sinks and so forth. It's all electric. Um, so the benefits of that, obviously, is you're not burning fossil fuels. Uh, the other side of that coin is, is that um, while the air conditioning costs are extremely efficient, the heating costs are a little higher than using fossil fuels. So there's a little bit of a cost to it. So the PV system is especially important to help offset that additional electric cost that you're going to have. The biggest impact um, on, on your heating and cooling system in a commercial building is the fresh air requirement, which you don't have in your house, right? We, we heat up the air in the wintertime and we cool it off in the summertime and then we have to blow it all outside and bring in fresh air that's either hot or cold and do it all again. But we will have an energy recovery system in this part of the mechanical system so that all of the exiting air will pass through a heat recovery wheel and then that heat that we're pulling out of the air or the cold that we're pulling out of the air will be used to temper the outside air that comes back in. So it will be very efficient, but it, it will cost more to heat and cool this building than it does your original one. Um, I mean, the biggest factor is really this, the size of it. It's so much bigger than your original building. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam Predmore, and thank you very much for being here and doing this presentation. Uh, a question, a comment, and then another comment. Um, I also wonder about that bump out on the right hand side. Um, I think the existing bump out that is the stairway and the currently um, the executive director's office 
just doesn't fit with the building. And so I feel the same way that the bump out on the right hand side that you're proposing ought to be similar in design in terms of what it looks like from the outside. Um, then in terms of the trees, do I understand therefore the with this design, you are not going to need to take down any of the large trees on the, the lot? That's right. The plan is to keep all of the large trees that are on the site currently. Wonderful. Um, I'm also a member of the ad hoc senior housing committee, and there is a group that's working on the campus. There's a trifold display back here that involves the library, the church, the 1888 school building, et cetera. There's been a discussion about heat pump system. Are you planning to tie into that at all? Should that be developed? We, we met with those folks uh, a couple of times, in, in, including actually before we got started on just schematic design again. Um, and to tell you the truth, I'm not, I'm not sure that that, we're, we're happy to connect to a system if, if that, that committee cr creates one. Uh, the way I understand it right now is, is that that's on hold. It is, it is in fact on hold, but if there's a potential to tie into it, should that happen? Um, that could help with the the cost of the um, utilities. Sure, because I mean, basically, a, a mechanical system has, in, in our case, an internal component and an external component. Right now, the, the plan is for the external component to sit on the ground. Uh, I haven't identified exactly where that's going to be yet. It could potentially even sit on the roof. I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, my engineers are still working on that. That outdoor component could go away, and we could connect into a, a ground source. For example, if that's something that the town decided to do, um, and we could use that as a heat sink or a heat draw, um, the the system will still basically function the way it is. The further we go down the road designing the system that we have, the trickier it is to make that change. But yeah. we could still do it now. But if, if you ask so me in another it's month, it's, as it, it, you ask me in another month, it's going to start getting harder if I'm going to meet this schedule that. Um, my friend Dan has put together. So don't kill my schedule. <laughs> please, please don't kill my schedule. Yeah. Um, we, we, we get it. We truly do. Um, but, you know, like it, all municipal projects in Massachusetts right now, um, our goal is to keep to schedule, not because of the heat pump savings or not getting the heat pump saving, but because the cost of building buildings is going up between 8 and 10% a year. Yeah. So we're trying to keep on track to, to stay within the appropriation to which the the voters of the town of Deerfield have entrusted us. That's so yeah. <laughs> so yes, uh, I think Phil's correct. It, it could happen and it could be part of your project. Having done a lot of these projects, I don't think you'll be ready by the time that our project is done. Mm -hmm. uh, but should it get started and and we certainly would shift on the fly to try and accommodate it. One last question on the parking lot that, that you're proposing on the side, moving that out, which is a great idea, but um, is there any thought to putting the solar shed type things um, over those, both to protect the cars that are there, um, provide shade when needed for people walking in and out, and potentially also increase the solar gain if panels are on top of that. Any any thought to that? Um, we have not looked at that. We we certainly can. Um, the the bottom line is that they're really expensive. Um, basically, I have to build a structure that sits up in the air uh, and acts like a sail. Right. It it's going to take a wind load. It's going to take a snow load. Right. Um, so it, it's a substantial structure. Um, if we were going to put them on the ground, setting them on the ground the way you see them on the sides of the highway and stuff um, would be the way to go. Um, that's the way they that's the why they do it that way. Folks that, that put them up over the parking areas um, are doing it to provide additional shade to the parking area, uh, which is a benefit, but it's an expensive, expensive benefit to do. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Erica Higgins Ross. I just want to say I love the bump out. <laughs> I feel like I feel like somebody needs to say it so that you guys hear that there are both opinions. I think it's really elegant, and I like the mixed um, materials. I like the brick, and then I like the complement. I think it's really beautiful. And then also, you mentioned there's going to be a um, 
a meeting room at night available and it will be able to be closed off. Can you show again where that is just so I can get a sense of, because right now we're doing a lot of night programming already, squishing it and it'll be nice to have to So if, if you were to enter the building at the main door here, um, there is a lobby that goes straight through to the back of the building and out. Everything to the left of that door in this direction is meeting room, and then the storage rooms and, and the toilets and the kitchenette are all in that zone right there. So it's basically this end of the building. If bottom floor, yeah, yeah. So if if I had the model inside this building done and you were to peek in there, <laughs> right now you can I think you can see the grass. Um, uh, we won't have any grass inside the building. Um, that's a promise. Um, but right inside there was where the meeting room would be. And that will have a 80, 80 seat capacity. So lots of space. It, 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 it has been something that was requested even back in the grant phase that the lack of meeting space in the town of Deerfield and that this could be helpful to be used when the library is not used. So the building's designed to be able to close off the library and use that space when the library is not being used. Hi, uh, my name is David James, and I was wondering about how are we going to make that building secure? Second question is, I read that if you want to come in after hours, you got to have a key. So I'm kind of curious as to how many keys, who's going to keep track of it, who's going to run them down when they're not returned, just little things like that. So that is one of the things that is really a policy decision, um, but it will, um, we will have to cross that bridge with the building committee to a certain extent. It is not uncommon, and we would recommend that in a building like this, that you at least have the nighttime entrances um, on a keyless entry system. Um, and a keyless entry system works on a variety of different ways. It is a code that you can punch in, or you can wave a card or put it in, or, or use a fob on your keys. There's a variety of different systems that you can use. Um, the benefit there is, is that when the staff comes in in the morning, they can also use that to open the building up. Um, I wouldn't recommend that all the building, all the doors are, are that way, um, only because you certainly can, but it just costs more. Um, and the other thing that folks should understand is that when you have a keyless entry system, um, if the power is out, you can still put a key in the lock and turn the key, but the keys basically are going to stay with the key holders, which would be the folks that work at the library. And we think for a library, the thing that works the best is a key punch, because that way, when you reserve a room, whether you do it online or whether you do it by calling the library, they can send you out a confirmation email and that can have your code in it. And that code will work for you for your meeting. And then when your meeting's over, that code won't work anymore. And you won't need to run down a key or a fob or a card. That code just won't work anymore. But the town hall is on a FOB system now, and as we go through design development and construction documents, we'll have that discussion about security and trying to align the systems of the buildings in the town, too. The last thing we need is, you know, a new building that doesn't talk to the other buildings, and so we'll, 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 we'll work all that out, but there'll definitely be some sort of a time lock door at the front entrance that you know, can be swiped with a card or, or, or to, to get in. Could there be a direct line to the police department, fire department, those kinds of things? You're killing my budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will have a fire alarm system and that will have to have uh, yeah. a number that it goes to. And so um, the question is whether or not um, you want to install an intrusion alarm system in the building. It's um, it, it is is not very common to put an intrusion alarm system in a library. Um, there aren't a whole lot of things to steal when most things are free. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes we put them in, but basically if you're locking the doors, for the most part, you're going to be secure in a library. I can't think of the last library that we have done in the past 30 years that had an intrusion alarm system. Hi, guys. Go Lisa, easy, honestly. Oh, I am Lisa Perlman. One comment, uh, two questions. One that's a yes or no, one that might involve more. In terms of the key, what we used to do in Greenfield was we required the people who were using our meeting rooms after hours to leave the key in the meeting room. And if they didn't, we had their phone number and we could track them down. And then we would charge them money or we'd key and charge them for that. But 99 
100% of the time it worked with no problem. The people who, bar, who use library meeting rooms tend to be fairly conscientious about it. So it's a helpful thing. So yes or no question. Are we looking at LEED certification? Yes. That's all I need to know on that one. The one that might involve more discussion. Um, I love the design. I also do like the bump out as well. Um, was thought given to, and I'm assuming it's a cost thing, making the windows on the addition match in style the windows on the original building? Uh, we did think about that. Um, <laughs> I, <did> think <laughs> I have to ask. And it's and and the question has come up as as well. Um, if if you take a look at part of the reason is if you take a look at this these windows right here. Um, one of the things that we have in this building that your original building doesn't have um, is uh, is a big steel beam right across there that holds up the roof. Um, and so getting the windows to have round be round up at the top basically means you're getting right up into the structure. It's going to be difficult for us to do. The only way to do it really would be to lower them down. Um, and uh, and then would make them kind of short looking overall in the building. Um, the reason the proportions of the building here are, are basically the same uh, as your original building. But the difference here is, is that the floors don't line up. The floor in the addition is up a little bit. And the reason is because uh, your floor to floor height in your original building is very low from the lower floor to the main floor, um, basically is a finished basement. Uh, in order to have some large spaces like we do downstairs, including the children's room and the large meeting room, um, each of which are almost as big as the floor plate of the original building alone, um, in order to ha have a, a ceiling height in there that works with the structure that we need, with the ductwork that we need, uh, we needed to raise that floor up on the, on the addition. So when you come up the elevator, there are going to be two stops at the upper floor. You can get out the first stop on, on the existing floor elevation. Second stop will put you on the addition elevation, or there's a short flight of stairs that runs between them for folks that want to get their steps in. Do we have any more questions? Bill, could you discuss how you've um, picked up the white elements of the original building and the white elements of the window top? Said the same thing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. So, some of the inspiration, obviously, from for of the addition comes from your original building. Um, and if you take a look at a lot of the windows, have these placards over the tops of them that. I have names of authors or something chiseled into them. Um, we picked up on that with the with the with the window heads. The idea is that it's a similar material, probably won't be chiseled with the names of authors. Uh, but the idea is that we're trying to pick up on some of the cues from that existing building. Um, you have a gabled, parapeted. Uh, sorry, I'm in the trees here with the squirrels. Um, uh, you have a gabled, parapeted. Uh, That's a flat tree. <laughs> <laughs> so don't point those things. Out. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> so you have a gable wall with parapets on either end of it. Um, and basically, that is a big beefy piece of masonry. And it's got these little openings in it because <laughs> these two things that stick up on the ends are actually chimneys for the fireplaces that are inside the building. Uh, we aren't going to have fireplaces in the new building. And we aren't going to have big thick masonry walls like your existing building. Um, we are trying to pick up on that same theme though, however, and you can see that this long addition is basically the same with uh, height and design with the, with the parapeted gables at the ends as your original building, which is part of the reason why the things that poke out from this shape are, uh, are different. We're trying to maintain a form that is gabled, that has that parapet, has the two large windows and the ends similar to your original building, picks up on these large um, lintels that are over the top, which reflect those guys. And then the things that stick out from this mass are the parts that are white. Um, so there's a little bit of a method to the madness. We're trying to separate out that original form so that it reads through and, and it's clear what we're trying to do. And so both at the rear, uh, in the joint in the middle between the two buildings and again at the end where we're doing something a little bit different um 
we're we're trying to separate those forms off from the building so that that reads through and 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 the the idea behind the design doesn't get muddied up Sue Hef, and uh, can you tell me uh, what will be the capacity of the parking lot? I think we're, I think we're 26. Um, 26 cars. I think it is. I'm, I, I'm going to have to double check my plan. 26 it, or 27. It's, it's. Uh, Are you turning this look or are they doing that? It might just be the floor plans. That's just the floor plans. <laughs> Google top and count. I can come. It's it's on that board over there too. That that's this. That might be wrong. Yeah, those look too wide. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk over to my site plan over there and show it to you. <laughs> Yeah, and that was a calculation done by the um, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners for the grant um, because of the size of the, of the building. Um, the calculation came out to that number. Yeah, one per 400. We answered all the questions? Huh? <laughs> How many of those parking spaces are going to be handicap accessible? And are any of them going to be reserved specifically for certain staff members? And lastly, where will there be a bike rack? Two handicap spaces. Um, I don't know the answer about staff spaces. That's really a policy decision. Um, we certainly haven't been instructed to <laughs> to paint reserve for Candace or anything on the parking lot. <laughs> we don't have it in the budget. Um, and the last question is, where is the bike rack? I, I uh, We will have one. I don't know exactly where it's going to be. My guess is that it's going to be along this uh, walkway along in here somewhere is where I think my civil engineer would suggest putting it. Somewhere where it's convenient to the front entrance, but where if you, there's a couple more bikes on there that really belong there, or if a whole gang of kids comes up on their bikes and just piles them on there, um, the people won't be tripping over. There, there, there will also be a uh, electric charging in, in some spaces. I hadn't, Dorothy Milne, I hadn't thought of this before, but you're talking about the front entrance being in the addition. So is the actual front entrance still usable? Um, the handicap code has a funny little language in it that says that all primary entrances to a facility need to be accessible. And the definition of a primary entrance is all entrances. Um, okay. so that's the, answer that's no. the way the code's written. So, so no. no. Um, okay. Unless you apply for a variance from, from the Massachusetts Barriers Board and, and say that it is not technically or financially feasible to make that entrance accessible, um, there's a possibility. Um, I don't know that there's an effective way to do that. Yeah. Um, and and ramping or something obviously would, would fill up your whole front lawn and right. wouldn't be very nice. Um, <laughs> the majority of the folks are going to want to walk into this entrance just because right. it's easier. Right. Yeah. Um, but we have kind of thought about it a little bit. If you do come in that entrance, the folks that are sitting in the circulation desk will be able to see you. So if you decide at some point that you wanted to reopen it and it was something other than an exit only, um, you, we could accommodate it in the plan. Um, but right now it's designed as an exit. Okay. I won't tell the building inspector. Um, Eric Phelps, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you. 
Uh, I'm delighted to see the elegant solution of the angle. And I know the trees were a big thing that people cared about. And I love how that's opened up other possibilities. My one question is, is there anything about the entire thinking of this that you still feel a little stuck with? Like a little question still remains for the committee or for your design or something you're still trying to solve that people we may not have asked about quite yet. Oh, you're That's, asking if there's anything that I know that I don't know yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, 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 we worry right up to the big day. If that's your question, do we worry? Yes, of course we do. Yeah. Um, that's why we put all the parts and pieces in place on the schedule and the reviews, the constructability reviews. If you know the building is uh, a simplistic building, and, and part of that reason is to make a simplistic structural frame. Uh, and that in itself gives us a little breathing room on how it goes together. So we, we've been thinking about those type of things all along as the, as, as the building committee has developed the design. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about everything. Uh, I, I, I worry about, uh, you know, uh, hydrology, geology, everything you can imagine. Um, but we know that in design development, we're going to cross all the I's and dot the T's uh, and, and uh, we'll get past everything that normally comes up. Yeah. Dan calls me on the weekends. I call him on the weekends and at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but we, uh, basically the way the design process works with schematic design, you're looking, we're looking at more, more big picture elements, uh, in design development, we're beginning to focus in, um, we're looking at, um, more finer grain things. And when you get into the working drawings, it's, it's really the minutia. And so the, the questions we ask and the things that we need to design and plan for as we work through the process, start out with much larger things. Um, you know, where does it go? Is it in the front? Is it the back? Or is it one of the sides? Um, are we going to take the building down? Those are the big questions that we ask very at the beginning. Um, we're not going to take your 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 old building down. We are going to take that addition down though, um, and we're going to restore that end uh, because some of those windows were turned into doors, and we're going to fix those up and put them back the way they were. So there's a little bit of work that has to happen there. Um, so uh, I don't think that there's anything big that's still kind of floating out there. Um, I think we've made the, the kind of major decisions on things like what it's going to look like, where it's going to go, um, if um, what the mechanical systems are. A lot of those large things have been kind of nailed down. But I do want to just add one small item too. I mean, Lisa had asked a question about you know trying to emulate the existing building. Uh, Phil did model putting arched windows in uh, and. It just didn't look right. Uh, you you can't match this building. It, for us to match this building would cost a fortune. Um, so it's complementary without being identical. And uh, I was arguing against the windows purely out of money. All right. Phil's arguing against the window because the facades didn't look right. So, you know, we have this dynamic where between all of us, we're coming up with the solutions that are going to work for Deerfield. And the building committee is not afraid to be vocal. So that's important. We go to a lot of towns where we don't get a lot of interaction. I can't tell you how many meetings we've gone to in Deerfield where it's like, yes, half an hour meeting. And then one question comes up and we're an hour debating an issue. That's really important. And that's 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 great. You, you're being well represented. But I, I I think you're going to really love this as you as you see the more of the, more of the modeling uh, and it, hopefully you can you can watch some of our meetings. I don't know whether our meetings are, are broadcast or not. Uh, our Zoom meetings. Um, well, of course they're you know open to the public, but they're also recorded and um, and I do send those to to be posted to be posted. Because yeah. you're going to see modeling of the inside, just like you see modeling of the outside. So you're going to get a feel for the inside of the building as we develop the inside of the building. And Phil's great. He'll, he'll fly through the building with his little computer, and, it, it, and, and it's going to look just like it looks. Candace or Phil or Satu, can you talk a little bit about what your plans for community engagement of children and parents in 
talking about colors, et cetera. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so we're kind of following in the footsteps of our model Greenfield Library. Did a great job reaching out to the teens, um, their teen librarian. We um, kind of took some um, cues from, from them. And so our teen librarian, Andrea, um, has been working with, the, starting with the sixth graders that are going to be seventh graders pretty soon. At the, so working at the elementary school um, with the sixth grade classes and then went to the middle school, high school and had a table in the lunchroom. And um, she got a hundred responses, uh, survey responses, and the teens are thrilled to uh, be having this space. And then our children's librarian decided she wanted to do the same thing. So she's, you know, of course she has to do a, a version that under, you know, easily understood by kids. And so she's going to be going and talking to um, the classes at the elementary school, uh, you know, one through five, and we'll have um, um, surveys available for the parents. So, and that's mostly going to be on decorative stuff, you know, um, color, texture, mood. Phil can tell a, a sweet story about how they've surveyed kids before and the ideas they got, um, which is really, really charming. Um, but that's the thing is like, you know, giving them um, power over, over their spaces and giving us ideas that we might not have thought of on our own. So I think the story that Candace is talking about is in Greenfield with it, teens put together a, um, a survey that they surveyed their peers and they and then they and then they all worked as a group with some adults and and put together a PowerPoint presentation with pie charts that had all the survey results and so forth. And then they presented that to me via a Zoom meeting during the pandemic. Um, which was uh, dynamite, by the way. Um, but um, and then they took turns as they kind of went through all the different things that they talked about and some of the things that they wanted. And um, we were about this far along in the design, I'd say some, somewhere similar. And one of the things that the teens wanted was window seats. And I was happy to report that we had window seats in the teens department. And I pointed out where those were in the plan. And then the person that was making that presentation at the point said, will will we be able to hear the the rain on the roof um because they wanted to sit in a little window seat that kind of poked out from the building and hear the rain uh fall on the roof which i thought was very thoughtful for teens um and if you go to the greenfield library you will see that at the last kind of moment we added a little addition on the teens department that kind of pokes out towards the post office um that is in addition to the the window seats that we have in the front that look out onto Main Street that has its own little roof uh, and a little padded seat. So I'm not sure with all that insulation that we have in there that they're actually going to hear the rain, but they'll hear it on the glass and it does poke right outside the building and it's really what they were looking for. Um, it's awesome. And it was fun to be able to do that uh, and then <clears throat> get the reaction back from the kids. That, you know, they really felt like they were engaged in the process and it was fun for us too. Window seats cost money. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. My name is Bonita Conlon, and um, I, I came in a few minutes late, so you might have covered this already. Um, my question: You were talking about taking away the the side on the left side of the building that has the chairlift in it yes okay so um, i'm wondering is is a piece of equipment it wasn't too long ago that seems like that we put it in and that was quite a bit of money i'm wondering are those pieces of equipment ever reused resold to a, a small business and recoup some of that money financially toward the cost of the library i mean it, it costs us i don't know somebody might remember how much it costs but it was quite a bit of money sure and it seems like it hasn't gotten that much use. So maybe some other business might like to use it if, if there's a process for that. I think Dan has an answer. I, 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 I got a little something I'll add as well. An answer uh, on the process. So as part of LEED, we're going to try to recycle everything that we can that we're demolishing. Uh, we get points for recycling and reusing. Uh, the lift was probably put in in the fourth edition of the building code. July 1st, we go to the 10th edition of the building code. As soon as you remove that lift, it's not going to meet the building code of today. Um, but it doesn't mean that parts and pieces of it can't be reused or recycled. Um, you know, we'll cross that bridge as, as we get further down the line. But 
to, it's not, I, I wish it was plug and play because there's so many uh, that have needs uh, with mobility. Right. Um, but it's uh, the, the elevator code in Massachusetts is probably the strictest code of all the codes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a tough one. Do you remember when it was put in? Ni 1996. It's almost 30 years, 1996. <laughs> Sorry. Make make that the third make that the third edition. Thank you. <laughs> and we do have a question um, from Kathy O'Rourke on, on Zoom. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, Candace. Can you hear me? Oh yep. good. Oh good. Um I was just wondering uh, what the composite of those windows in the new edition is going to be. Uh, are you are you looking at metal? Are you looking at um, fiberglass? Are you looking at wood? <clears throat> right now, the plan is to do insulated aluminum windows with triple pane glazing in them. Okay, so, uh, thank you. Thermally broken. They'll have a 20-year guaranteed finish on them. It'll be like an automobile. It'll, it'll be a long time before you have to paint them. Maybe, hopefully never. Great. Thank you. You uh, uh, my question was about signage. Um, I noticed on the side of the building in the rendering, there is a, the name of the building there. But I'm wondering if there was any thought given to either additional signage, uh, either for or against uh, what's already there. Uh, my my comment would be, and please don't take this personally. One of the worst things I've seen anywhere as a as a graphic designer is uh, the typography on the courthouse building in Northampton. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like it's it looks hideous. It's it's terrible, and I don't know if uh, if you know something uh, if this serves the purpose or if there needs to be any additional signage from the road that's more visible. I, I, will, I will tell you that without asking anybody in the building committee, I, I tried to find a font on my machine and there's, you know, there's at least two dozen of them on there that was similar to the logo that's used. And, and this is, what's this is a text, you would know the term better than I, it is, it's, it's a text mark basically right. Right. Uh, in the new logo, uh, very clearly um, in italics for the word library and, and, and a, and not in italics for the word Tilton. I found something that was the most similar to put a sign on there just to show the thinking. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're going to end up being stuck with what the manufacturers can make for us for the most part, right. Um, right. unless we have custom letters made. And Dan's going to tell me that I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> Sign, signage is a big deal. Uh, yeah. It's a big deal on all the projects. And not just the sign of the building, but wayfinding on the inside. As graphic designer, you clearly would understand uh, and you know, the small signs for uh, for getting around, occupancy of rooms, things of that nature. So that is a design development yep. item, and the building committee will be looking at signage at some point in time between now and bidding. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Heidi bauer -Klapp. Thank you so much for the presentation. This is really great. Um, could you say more about the cafe? Sure. So I, I will I will tell you what basically we are designing, and then <laughs> Candace can talk to you about how it might be used. Um, when we say the word cafe, it's really, it's um, what well, we need to call the room something. Um, and whether or not it's actually called cafe or not, I don't really know. I've never, Dan just mentioned that we're going to do room signage as part of the, as part of the project. Um, in all of the libraries that I've done that have included a cafe space. I've, I've never put up a sign on a wall anywhere that said cafe. Um, typically, what that means is, is that somewhere in your lobby, um, where we would typically have some kind of a hard-wearing floor surface so that you're not walking directly in from the outside in the salt and the snow onto our carpet, um, we'll have some kind of a hard floor surface uh, that's going to take the wear and tear, is easy to clean. Somewhere in that space, we'll have a little counter space and we'll have a sink. And what that would mean for you as a member of the public is that if you were to come in and your child or your children were in a program in the kids department, for example, and you wanted to hang out outside and look in through the glass and finish the coffee that you brought with you, uh, you could do that. And then you could dump out whatever you didn't finish 
uh, into that sink and rinse out your cup and recycle it. Um, that's the kind of minimum. Now, sometimes folks have, um, now in Sunderland, for example, there was a coffee shop down the street. And on Saturdays, the director would stop and pick up two thermos carafes. And they, she'd put them out when she opened on Saturday. And when they were gone, that was it for the week. Uh, and that's what she did in her cafe. So uh, we want to give you the flexibility to be able to do something. But basically, it's a space where people can sit, chat, catch up with their neighbors, uh, maybe keep an eye on, on their kids if they're in a program, um, and stay away from the more quiet parts of the library. We aren't really living in an era where Candace or somebody else is going to tell you, shh, in the library anymore. But there are folks that are studying or working on homework assignments or whatever. And, um, and we kind of think of these as the more quiet parts of the library. And the cafe space is just a kind of a space where you could go and kind of catch up uh, and have a little bit of community involvement uh, in this kind of and I kind of think of the library as one of those third spaces, right, where you can go and kind of catch up with folks. And the cafe space would be where you do that. Does that answer the question? John Pareski has a question, Phil, online. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I'm concerned, uh, two, two points, and I joined a little late, so forgive me if you covered it. The roof over the walkway, the entranceway, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what about, how are you gonna handle water runoff? <coughs> excuse me, rain, where's, how are you gonna get rid of the water? So I think the question is about this roof over the canopy at the front here. Yes. And so we're gonna pick the water up there uh, with gutters probably that aren't shown in this model yet and take them down via downspouts that are probably gonna be right in front of one or two of these posts. And, and into the stormwater management system. Um, what stormwater management system is, is there one there now? There isn't one now, but we are gonna be designing one that will support the paved area in the parking lot and the, and the uh, non-permeable other portions of the site, such as the walks and the roofs. So we're gonna pick that water up and then um, the current code say that we need to manage that water on site and either recharge it into the soil or somehow manage it um, so that the uh, post development isn't any worse than the pre development case. So we're not dumping more water into your stormwater, into your municipal stormwater management system than you have now. So we're probably recharging that, but the civil engineers are still working on that. I can't answer the question about exactly what they're doing because they haven't finished that design. So there's going to have to be some pitch might be small, but to that roof, correct? Yes, it's, it's a lot easier for a model like this for me to draw that flat, but it will have some kind of minimum pitch to it. That's right. Okay, I have one other question on this. I guess it's the south end of the building. Can you rotate over to that for me, um, please? I'm on the south, so. Okay, and then it's the uh, west. The parking yeah. lot side. The parking lot side, okay. <clears throat> no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right there, the four windows. There's Here. a lot, a lot of brick space above that. Can we do something to make it a little nicer looking instead of just this big wall of bricks? Um, like like the old library has that. I guess it's like a compass there. I don't know what. Yeah, that probably is. And there would be some kind of emblem that goes up there. Yeah, so there's, a, there's a little bit of an attic space up there with something or that's a decoration. Um, the whole idea of the of the design of the addition when you compare the two um, is, is that when we're not trying to replicate that original building with all of the decorative elements that are on there from the coining and the overhangs, um, the little um, the little brick and 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 marble uh panels and so forth, the little decorative elements, and then obviously your front porch with its kind of classical columns and and um, impediment and so forth. Um, there's not really enough money in order to, to accomplish that. And so what we're doing is tying, taking cues from buildings of this era and designing an addition that is sympathetic to um, this, but scaled down. So we're trying to simplify it so it's not as decorated so that it allows this building to maintain its prominence. 
Um, I mentioned early on, and you may have missed it, that a lot of buildings of this era, if it had an addition in the back, there's lots of libraries like this, a kind of um, kind of a Carnegie-esque library where you come in the front doors in the center, reading rooms left and right, and then a stack wing in the back. Um, that stack wing on a building of this era would lots of times be masonry, have a little bit of white trim, but it wouldn't have the coining, it wouldn't have the keystones, a lot of those things, it would fall off at the rear. Um, and so we're trying to design an addition that does the same thing, a simpler version of what's happening all front. Okay, thank you. You bet. Hi, uh, Jim Cambias. Um, following up on John's question about roof pitch, will the um, the uh, bay, the white bay structure on the north side of the building, and the uh, the bay window on the west side of the building, will those roofs also have some pitch to them? Yes. Um, I, I can't. Uh, I'm in the trees again. I I can't really do a flat roof anymore. Um, uh, a, a flat roof is one of those things where um, people say flat roof even though uh, lots of schools, for example, will have a flat roof. Uh, that just means you can't see the pitch from the ground. Um, in the 40s and the 50s, they designed dead flat roofs uh, that were just absolutely flat with the thinking that the water couldn't get too deep before it found a roof drain or something. Um, but that's a code, that's code violation now. Um, they need to be pitched to drain, even if we're calling them flat or they look essentially flat. And we need overflows in case the drain gets clogged and isn't maintained. Right. It's a good thing you don't have any trees close by. Okay, I'm looking at the time and we did say an hour and a half. So if we want to stay within that time, we'll probably start wrap, wrapping it up. Any final questions from anyone? We'll find a place. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and um, I'll be putting these drawings that fill these lovely drawings on our website in the next day or two. So if you want to take a second look at a second, third, fourth, look at them, they'll be on our website. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>